Hi, I'm Dave Jones and I'm the host of the Electronics Engineering video blog and I do a regular weekly or twice weekly uh, video blog for electronics engineers, hobbyists, hackers, makers, uh, anyone involved in the electronics industry at all. And I uh, do product reviews, uh, tutorials, teardowns, things like that and uh, it's been quite successful. I've been doing that for about a year and a half now. I am a professional electronics design engineer. That's my day job, but uh, by night I do my engineering video blog and it's very successful. I can't believe there's an audience out there for it, but it looks like there is. They can't get enough, so it's growing exponentially. I really love it. My day job is uh, electronics design engineer, but I actually work for a software company designing electronics uh, tools. So it's a bit different being a hardware engineer at a software company. It's, it's kind of strange actually. Uh, whereas I come from mostly a uh, large uh, military defense company background. I've worked on ocean bottom seismic survey gear, towed arrays, military sonar systems and things like that. So I come from a bit of a big company mentality to now a smaller software company and my day job is designing uh, development boards for engineers like me. There, there are still uh, companies in Australia doing, uh, well, not, not really niche, we are a mainstream product, but um, Australia is really still a place that you can do uh, R&D and actually sell from Australia with the e-commerce revolution and, and the information revolution. You don't have to be based overseas anymore. It's, you know, oh, we do have offices overseas, but you really, you can do everything from Australia and nobody knows anything different. In fact, it's quite novel being from Australia because uh, everyone loves Australians. So it, it, it can actually work to your advantage being based here. When I was a kid, I was probably six or seven and I kept taking everything apart. I was just, I was a typical uh, kid of the day. If you were in inquisitive about how anything worked, you took apart stuff and there were no no computers back then to distract you from that sort of thing so you took apart electronics and my parents bought me uh, one of those 50 in one electronics project kits and oh that was just that was just my entire world and uh, it, it started from there I bought my own test equipment I had my own lab by the time I was eight in my bedroom I'd have my workbench and I would ah oh, it was it was just fantastic by the time I was 11 I'd had my own uh, shed out the back which would be my workshop and now you know here I am it's uh, 25 30 years later I've still got a a, uh, a workshop in my garage a lab in my garage and um, so things started from there and I was uh, first published at about 13. I got uh, an article published in Electronics Today International, which was one of the um, leading electronics magazines here, along with Electronics Australia as well, which I eventually got a whole host of articles published in there. And that's, that's how I got my start really. Um, and I started my formal engineering education at um, the very early age of 15, which was quite unusual at the time, but um, that, that really um, set me up early. So uh, by the time I was, uh, by the time I hit the age of 20, I was um, pretty much, um, you know, I was uh, published, I was, um, uh, I had a couple of years experience working in the field and I was qualified. So it's really quite a remarkable um, story. There's not too many people I can remember that actually helped me. I was pretty much on my own. I didn't really know anyone in electronics. Uh, but at my first job, there are a few uh, mentors there who would uh, teach me some stuff. But, but really, I'm, I'm pretty much, I like to think, self-taught, uh, so to speak. Um, although I do have formal engineering qualifications, I like to think that I pretty much knew um, a good uh, lot of it before I actually did that. So I'm, I'm probably possibly quite different to many in that I didn't um, really, uh, there wasn't anyone around me who I could sort of, you know, uh, feed, you know, feed from. And um, I had to do it all myself in my garage on my own. And, um, and that's why I got uh, published and things like that to get my, get my designs out there and get uh, known. Yeah, I pretty much uh, taught myself electronics um, in my in my uh, in my bedroom in my garage out the back when I was um, seven, eight, ten, twelve in my teenage years, and um, that's all I mucked around with. That was my hobby, electronics, and I was um, I didn't really, with hindsight, I didn't really learn 
a huge amount, but because you were just tinkering with it every day and that laid the foundation for, um, for my entire career and what I do now and, and study and things like that. So that was really beneficial. Well, I started with the uh, 51 electronics project kit, but that then led to buy, me buying my own breadboard, one of those solderless breadboards with the plug holes in them and you'd plug the components. You'd go down to Dick Smith and you'd buy a, a grab bag of components and you'd that would be your, you know, your junk box, your parts bin and a traditional electronics uh, hobbyist stuff which is still around today. I can't believe it. Uh, people still do the same thing. The tools are still there. The solderless breadboards, the Vero board, you'd get a soldering iron and then if you wanted to make up something permanent you'd build it up on Vero board and then you'd uh, it'd lead to etching your own PCBs. Um, now printed circuit boards are all designed by computer. You know you lay it out on the screen and and you get it printed or you send it off to a shop but um, back then you would lay them out the tapes, you would get tapes on the film and you would lay them all out and you'd spend hours just routing the tracks manually with the tape, cutting them with the exacto knife and, and, that's, and that's pretty much how you got things done um, uh, back, in the, um, back in the 70s and 80s. By the end of the 1980s I, um, I actually started work and, uh, and the computer revolution was starting to take over so I'd do uh, PCBs on computer and, and uh, yeah, the industry was sort of starting to change in that respect, everything was being computerised and, and it was a bit different but yeah mid to mid, mid 80s was, was I, I think the late 70s mid 80s was sort of like the golden age of hobby electronics I think and that was that was the age everyone remembers. Everyone my age looks back and remembers with uh, fond memories of how they um, how they used to lay out the boards themselves and just uh, you know there was nothing else to distract you and yeah great times. The community, especially here in Australia, uh, we didn't have as large a community as um, say Silicon Valley in the US. You would have all the all the uh, excess surplus component houses in the US. And, uh, but here in Australia, the community was pretty much um, revolved around the electronics magazines, Electronics Australia, Electronics Today International, Talking Electronics um, were, were some of the main rags back then. And that pretty much was the industry. You bought the magazine, you knew everyone who published in them, and there weren't really any community groups in Australia that I was aware of um, back then. Like um, these days, you've got hacker spaces and things like that where you can go and you can you know, hack with like-minded people and do electronics design, but yeah, back in those days it was, um, it, it was a bit different. At least I didn't see anything here in Sydney, Australia, that's for sure. It was, um, it was, it was quite, a, quite a lonely business. Um, you, you really didn't um, have any avenue apart from going down to your local Dick Smith store or reading the electronics magazines. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The big, even though the local Dick Smith store or the local Tandy store back then, Tan Tandy still sold the individual components. You could buy two resistors in a packet. Oh, for, you know, a dollar. It was, it was crazy. But even though the local Dick Smith store might have only been, you know, a short bus ride away or something, I would make the pilgrimage into um, uh, what was called uh, Silicon Alley back then, which was York Street in uh, Sydney, which had all of the major players there. Uh, David Reed Electronics, Tandy, Dick Smith, J Carr were all um, in that one little, they're all literally right next to each other. So I'd make the pilgrimage, I'd jump on the train and I'd ride it into the city. I was only like 10 or 11 or something like that. And I would ride into York Street and you'd just spend all day hopping between these shops and it was just, Oh, it was heaven for an electronics hobbyist back then, really. And then there was um, Sheridan Electronics, which was a uh, traditional um, junk shop, kind of. Um, I don't, they don't exist anymore, and um, they were based in, um, in the city somewhere at the time. But then they moved out western suburbs, Blacktown, near out where I live, and I thought that was the greatest thing ever. But unfortunately, that was right at the tail end of the hobby electronics um, surplus sort of uh, time, so they didn't last too long, unfortunately. Parts was everything. Pretty much the only thing you could design was um, what you had in your junk box, what you could get at the local Dick Smith or uh, Tandy's or something like that. And the information uh, was quite important. The information or the information on the chips you had, it was only in what was in your data, it was what was in your library. You'd have data books, stacks of data books and really you know so 
having access to components and um, information was everything. And that's completely changed these days. It's uh, totally different. Oh, the, the Tandy stores back then, it was all about the components. You would walk in, they'd have the components behind the counter. They would, then they'd have racks, they'd have surplus bins. They would have, you know, all the old uh, gear that, um, that was, uh, that they had uh, tested and always all products that had been returned and they were faulty. So you'd buy the faulty products. And I can remember I used to live um, just uh, not too far from the main, main uh, Tandy Electronics Australia headquarters and they would actually get rid of all their surplus gear in their main in a back room of their main shop front and I would I would frequent that all the time and but, but that's what you got you walked in you bought your surplus parts and you bought your broken items and your discontinued items and you just ripped those to bits and that was great back then people working there would actually know um, you know they would know about the components they were hobbyists themselves you had to be um, a, a hobbyist to actually work there and um, now of course they don't know anything about it so you just go in get the parts and you go to the counter and they don't know what to do with it you know they go what's this and you have to actually do all the legwork for them to get the write down the individual part numbers it's crazy but that's the way the world's going oh there's not too many um, shop fronts it's all pretty much internet based these days I don't know of any um, shops in Sydney left around that are oh, Oatly Electronics is probably the only one where you can actually walk into and actually buy um, uh, you know the traditional sort of um, not range of components but kits and surplus items and things like that the internet is is everything it's completely changed the industry the information revolution being able to have all that information and uh, e-commerce and to be able to buy parts on the internet and have them tomorrow stock availability information data sheets before we used to have uh, data books bookshelves full of data books now it's all available online instantly just like that and uh, really we can't do modern electronics design without the internet and without the communications revolution jcar are actually um quite remarkable they're still hanging in there it's uh i i find it quite remarkable how they can still have that focus on electronics components. The people who work there aren't really hobbyists, but that, you know, it doesn't make too much difference. They've got a bigger range than they ever have. People have said that JCAR are going downhill because they've got the farting novelty gadgets and things like that, but they've explained that they have to have those to pay the bills, so you know, it's that's sort of understandable. I've never had to design a farty gnome or, or a spanko meter or anything like that, um, but I would love to. I'd love to write the functional performance specification and go into a design review meeting for, for a farty gnome. That'd be just... That'd be, that'd be heaven. There, there seemed to be a lot of stores back then. Um, there were four or five major players whereas now pretty much um, uh, JCAR and Altronics are still the only two major players. There's Oatly Electronics with their surplus gear but there, there did seem to be a lot more component suppliers around back then um, and with them being all based in Silicon Alley you could go to one location and have everything available. The internet has totally changed component suppliers. Now it's online catalog, online parametric searching has totally revolutionized the industry. I can search, put in my parameters for a certain design and up pops 50 parts. Are they in stock? Can I get them tomorrow? Yes, beauty, I'm gonna order them. And they offer free delivery, next day delivery. It's just, it's just totally changed the electronics industry. The uh, speed of uh, the getting parts off the internet these days as compared to being able to just walk down to your local store, it hasn't really had that much of an impact I don't think because it might delay you by a day but you can get parts couriered same day or next day so it doesn't doesn't slow you down all mu that much but the huge side benefit is that now you have almost an infinite variety of components available which you've never had back in the old days I wouldn't trade the modern age for anything it's important to have a, a small amount of components around a lot of these still I've got from the 1980s when I was a kid. They're still my original component drawers and uh, I'm sure a lot of the components are a bit dodgy now, but it's important to have a few basic jelly bean components available just so you can build things on the spot like that. I was more into the Tandy 
50 in one. I had the 50 in one. That's what I started. That started me in electronics. 50 in one, 100 in one, 200 in one. By the time I finished those, I was a bit too advanced for the Funway series, but I do remember those. And J Car still sort of carry that on now with their short circuits kits. But um, yeah, those things are still available and they're still the best way to learn electronics. Making electronics fun was all the rage back in those days. It's, it's what you did to get people to buy your particular kit, be it a, a Dick Smith Funway kit or a Tandy 50-in-1 kit. It was all about the fun experience of, of uh, going through the instructions and building things and getting that help along the way. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty good marketing ploy. One of the main things with building kits was that uh, it allowed you to get, especially test gear, at very low cost. So test gear was expensive uh, back in those days. So if you could build your own power supply, for example, um, from a kit, it was it was much cheaper and it was very rewarding. You'd build it up and it'd work, or sometimes you'd hope it didn't work so that you could troubleshoot it and you'd learn so much from actually troubleshooting the, the product that you actually built. You learnt more than building it itself. The field of ham radio, that was, that was pretty much the uh, catalyst to the hobbyist electronics um, market in all parts of the world, uh, really, back in, the, back in the 60s and 70s, and that led on to hobby electronics and microcontrollers and, and more advanced stuff which we find today. I don't know about apprenticeships because I wasn't involved in apprenticeships back in those days, but I found it was very uh, easy to uh, go to TAFE and study electronics. University was, uh, was a bit harder to get into, but um, you could learn a hell of a lot from just an a electronics TAFE course. It's changed these days where you don't learn as much detailed electronics as you did back then. But um, there, were, there were avenues, there were multiple roads into electronics in those days. And, and even today, you still do not need qualifications to work in the electronics industry. It's, it's your talent, it's your ability that, uh, that actually uh, gets you a name for yourself and gets you a job. A lot of hobbyists who are brought up in the field and study from an early age, that's all they want to do. They, that's all I wanted. To, uh, that's all I wanted to do when I was young was study electronics. So that's why when I was 15, I had the choice between going to do another two years of HSC and uh, just you know waste two years of my life, or go do a two-year electronics course at TAFE. <laughs> there was no contest at all. I went to study electronics, and that was just what you did. And it's no surprise to me at all that. Uh, some of the best guys in the industries either do not have qualifications or came from that hobbyist background. Um, that's just that's just a very common way it is in the electronics industry. Sources of information are all available with the internet. You can watch my blog for a start, the electronics engineering video blog. It's out there, tutorials for people who, who are starting out in electronics. Uh, over half of my audience is uh, a hobbyist, hacker, make a sort of uh, level, people getting into students. Um, but there's, there's an infinite amount of uh, information out there with Wikipedia and uh, almost any information you desire, you type it into Google, it's at your fingertips. So the, um, the opportunities for self-learning uh, are just almost infinite. Um, MIT and a lot of other the big universities have all their lectures available online. You can sit there and do an entire MIT degree from the comfort of your lounge chair. It's just absolutely remarkable. Magazines still have a role, they still have a place, uh, but they have to provide a higher quality content uh, than what you can get online these days. So there's still a role for them, a niche role, but um, they, they really need to evolve with the times, I think. It's, you can't do the old fashioned, you know, a flashing LED with a triple five timer. You've got to, you know, it's all about microcontrollers and you, they really, the magazines have to move with the times or be left behind. After you do your course, you can, you can go straight into a job, but really you've got to have a passion for electronics outside of university, outside of study. It's those people who, who will be picked first for the job. Smart companies will pick people who are keen and interested um, in electronics, not just somebody who's turned up to classes and they've got their degree or they've got their, got their diploma. It's, uh, it's really something that, that you have to work at on a personal level to help your stepping stone up further in your career.
I pretty much started the EEV blog just on a whim. I just thought there's so many text blogs out there and but there was no video blog, there was no personality, there was no uh, you know, uh, entertainment behind their text blogs are pretty boring. Uh, if you've read them, they're just, you know, there's there's no substance to them, really. Just a, a small little blurry photo of the author. I didn't want that, so I sat in front of a webcam and started filming. No idea, off the cuff, and it's worked. I think it really has put a face to engineering. Now my face is, is, is famous. I've got like, you know, 5,000 regular um, viewers who just can't wait to download my latest uh, video. And it's, and, and it's given me a profile and I think it has put a friendly um, face, a, a crazy face it could be, but at least it's a face behind electronics. I think every industry needs its characters, it needs its, needs its uh, high profile people, otherwise it's just boring and you know, who is there to either look up to or even hate. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm fine with people, uh, people hating me, they don't like the way I present things, they don't like my voice. That's all right. Love me or hate me, it's important to have um, people out there just that um, are figureheads, really. Me setting up the EEV bloggers is kind of a reaction to not having a local outlet for um, just presenting my ideas and things I want to talk about. Um, so it, it just allows me to reach a global audience and a local audience um, because I don't Having, I like to rant on about stuff, I like to talk about stuff, get enthusiastic about electronics, and uh, the EEV blog's a great outlet for that, because I can't just, uh, you know, I can do it at work around the water cooler or whatever, but over the office cubicle, prairie dog style, but um, it's, it's just not the same. I can sit in front of the camera and rant on and not care what people think. <laughs> it's vitally important to have that hobbyist hacker sort of background because it gives you the enthusiasm to learn things. If you just go to university and learn things by route and pass your exams, you're not, it doesn't really uh, sink in there as well as if you're totally enthusiastic and working things on the side. It really helps with your career and all aspects of it if you're into hobby electronics. The hackerspace phenomenon is really quite remarkable. It's only come around in the last uh, few years, four or five years. It's formed from the um, from this new, pretty much new hacker slash maker uh, market where these smart kids are really into hobby electronics by default and they don't really know it. They're taking apart their iPhones, they're buying a, a, a soldering iron and a, and a five dollar multimeter and they're, and they're hacking these gadgets and hacker spaces are just these open community places, a, a building or somebody's garage where you can go into and you can uh, be with like-minded hackers. You can share the gear, share community gear, and, and just build robots and hack stuff or do whatever. It's not just electronics, it's all about um, uh, you know, robots and mechanical stuff or making um, other arty type stuff. So hacker spaces are really quite a remarkable um, innovation in terms of a community um, support group, really. I, I think the hacker spaces are really uh, quite vital to this this new blood of, of uh, default electronics hobbyists coming along. They don't know they want to get into electronics, but at least know they want to hack stuff. They're inquisitive. Um, whereas, uh, you know, five, six years ago, ten years ago, they might have just turned to computer programming. Now they can uh, now they can just hack things and get into electronics, and then maybe start a career or start a company. There's so many. Uh, companies out there now, open source um, hardware companies who are formed from people from hacker spaces and they're making tens of millions of dollars in, in, in revenue from just um, you know starting up a little side business based on their hacking stuff they learned in Hacker Labs. I think it's vital. The Arduino project started as a, uh, as a little development board for artists, non-electronics people who knew nothing about it, to uh, design interactive objects. You know, in a museum you might have an interactive display or something like that. You want to, you know, you push a button and you want an LED to come on or a sound to make a sound or a motor to turn. And the Arduino came around because um, uh, to, allow, to enable uh, non-technical people to build interactive projects. And it's sort of um, spawned into this um, uh, 
industry standard development board for entry level hobbyists, hackers, makers, and uh, it's been very successful. It's quite remarkable. All these open source uh, development boards like the Arduino have, have, have been around for ages, but they're sort of this new type of board with the software, it's all ready to go, and you can just develop a application just like that, straight off the bat, and allows companies to get a working prototype of some concept or some idea on the floor within you know, hours you can present it to, uh, you know, your board or you present it to your customers and and there's the concept. We just need a bit more money to refine it. So the Arduino and other types of uh, uh, industry development, uh, rapid development boards are, are really important from that aspect. That's one of the uh, advantages of the Arduino is it, it is cross-platform. You can use it on Linux and Windows and God knows what else. You can port it to anything you want. It's open source, the source code's there. You can just move it to any platform. And that and that has some great advantages because not everyone's using Windows these days. Linux is, is a big thing. Open source projects are creating new opportunities. Open source hardware, not just open source started as software, but now there's these open source hardware and open source hardware companies that are forming and a lot of my own personal projects I'm releasing as open source hardware because it just um, it, it excites people and it gets people um, thinking wow it's free I can do so much with it and it's even if it's it can even be a, um, a psychological aspect to it as well um, it's being open and free and people just sort of love that sort of thing so I think it's it's really the future the future for my particular company who I work for is, is looking very bright. We're leading the industry in terms of uh, concepts and ideas and that's um, a lot of where the focus will be is actually uh, rapid design electronics because design cycles are shorter and shorter. You know, nine months was quoted as the typical design time. It can even be shorter than that. You need something working, a concept, a proposal working overnight just like that. And it's important to have rapid development tools in place to actually make that happen. So uh, my company is actually developing rapid electronics development tools to enable um, easy and simple and rapid design of electronics uh, concepts and electronics prototypes. I can't see a day when the Australian electronics industry isn't going to be around. I just I just can't fathom it. It's uh there is so many keen people here with ideas. I just can't picture the industry uh folding. It, in fact, I see a great future for it.